Good morning. The few and the mighty, we got to get these chatter boxes to sit down. That, that includes you ladies in the back row there. We are glad you're all here this morning. Welcome on this beautiful fall day. I appreciate cool weather. Any uh, visitors, anybody we want to recognize this morning? Point out, whatever. Good to have all you folks here. The regulars, if you will. We're making our way in. We'll get started. I don't really have a lot of things. Um, I would mention that the youth group's kicking off tonight at 6. They're calling it family night. So be sure and be involved in that if you can. It says you're going to have a meal and a meeting. So youth group tonight starting at 6. And like I said, I don't have a lot of other things to mention. Most of them are in the bulletin or up front or whatever. A lot of different things going on with the Hearts for the Homeless and IDES and so forth and, and the Ukrainian folks. So be sure and help out there when you can. The next event, if you will, for fellowship and so forth is Trunk or Treat. And that's, of course, the end of October, so... Um, any other things we should mention announcement wise or whatever before prayer time? Linda? Yes. Yeah, I was going to get that prayer time. Yeah. You know, everybody that knows that uh, uh, Richard Witt passed away this morning, I think 3.30, about a two. He did get home. He was in hospice, but he, he was home for approximately a week, I think, or so. So um, remember there family but from what i understand and everything and why it was it was time so we know he's in a better place um in that regard any other prayer requests then or things we should mention i know we're trying to remember like i said uh, john and nancy are gone with his family there in florida and so we we'll us remember them in in our prayers um any others all right let's uh, let's go to the lord Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for our many blessings, and we know there's a lot of things going on. We know families are hurting for difficult decisions and, and for loss. We pray for the Witt family. We know Richard and, and what a man of God he was and his family and, and all they did to serve this church through the years. And we just pray, Lord, that you'll be with them now and give them peace and comfort. And we know that there's that hope. We know for uh, if we live for you, that we'll be with him and with others in heaven someday. We thank you for everyone that's here this morning, and we pray a blessing on them. And as we sing and as we have communion time and as Tom shares your word, help us to be open to what you have for us, Lord. And be willing to share the good news with those around us and whatever way we can throughout the week Would that be a, a time that we can sit down and talk or or just a, a smile or a kind word or a gesture that your light would shine through us and we pray for uh, the ones that are not with us this morning as we mentioned that might be traveling or or they're not feeling well several were mentioned and or the shut-ins that in their situation, Lord, again, your spirit would be here and your spirit would be with them as well. Just guide and direct us always, Lord, and to help us be thankful for our blessings. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Let's be standing, please, as we start our services this morning. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ, Christ 
what a blessed one gives to all. Wonderful words of life, sinnerless to the loving call. Wonderful words of life, all so freely given, moving us to heaven. Wonderful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Wonderful words of life, Jesus, only Savior, sanctify and forever. Wonderful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior, standing, standing. Standing on the promises that cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing Standing on the promises I cannot fail, listening every moment to the Savior's call. <laughs> the Savior of my all and all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. may be seated. <laughs> there shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing. Showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, precious reviving again. Over the hills and the valleys, sound of abundance of rain. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, oh, that today they might fall. Now as to God we're confessing, now as on Jesus we call, showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us 
hearts are falling, but for the showers we plead. This will be our communion hymn. <clears throat> I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me. On the cruel cross he suffered from the curse to set me free. Sing, oh, sing, Redeemer, sing, I will sing of my Redeemer with his love. He purchased me with his blood. My pause is out my heart and made the day and made me free and made me free. I will sing of my Redeemer and his heavenly love to me. He from death to life hath brought me, Son of God, with him to be. For communion meditation this morning, I'm going to be reading from 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. John writes, My dear children, I write this to you so you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. To people who are feeling guilty and condemned, John offers reassurance. They know they have sinned, and Satan is demanding the death penalty. When you feel this way, don't give up hope. The best defense attorney in the universe is pleading your case, Jesus Christ, your advocate, your, de de your defender. Plus, he's the judge's son. He has already suffered your penalty on, in your place. You can't be tried for a case you know, that's no longer on the docket. United with Christ to plead your case, he has already won it. We find this reinforced in Romans chapter 8, verses 33 and 34. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. And we find this reinforced again in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 24 and 25. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we gather around your table, we ask for your blessing on both this cup and this loaf as that they are weekly reminders to us of Jesus' perfect sacrifice for our sins. We thank you for our perfect defender, Jesus Christ. Because you have provided for our defense, we gain that hope of eternal life with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
kids can head to kids' church now. It's good to see you all this morning. I have had a, a very strange week. I had jury duty this week. And I uh, went in for jury selection on Monday, and uh, there were probably 50 of us crammed in there, and they only had to choose uh, for this. It was a civil trial, so I had to choose six jurors and two alternates, and I got chosen. <laughs> and uh, the jur trial started immediately on Monday after jury selection and didn't end until Thursday and until uh, uh, we reached a verdict. And... Uh, very interesting watching the criminal justice or the civil justice in action and and uh, uh, and all, but uh, it, it it was fascinating, but gave me great faith in our system because the system was truly working and uh, decisions could be made. Uh, so turn your Bibles, please, to Matthew the thirteenth chapter. We're going to begin reading. Um, verses uh, uh, 3 through 9, and then we'll skip down to verse 18 and read a little further. Um, and he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, seed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground. When they did where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And I'm sorry, I, I got to get in the right light here. <laughs> uh, and when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. And then down to verse 18. Hear then the parable, the parable of the sower. When anyone who hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, has the cares of the world, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and another thirty. Pray with me, please. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. A boy was sent out to visit relatives in the country. He was a typical city boy and knew nothing about farming or country life at all. And one day he sees the farmer pulling a wagon, and he asked the farmer, what, what's that in your wagon? And the farmer said, well, that's manure. He kind of looks kind of strange. And he said, well, what do you do with it? And he said, well, I'm taking it out to put it on top of my strawberries. He shakes his head, and he said, you know, sir, you, you ought to come to our house and eat strawberries. We put ice cream on ours. Uh, 
I'm not a farmer. My vegetables come from Kroger. And besides, I don't care much for vegetables anyway. And so knowing there are farmers in the audience today, I will give you permission right now to laugh out loud this morning if I say something really stupid about farming. Now, I shouldn't say we're not a farmer. Jan declared last year that we were farmers. Um, the previous year, corn had been grown around our home, uh, where we live, we're surrounded by uh, fields, and um, the dog had apparently gotten a hold of an ear of that corn and brought it up to our front porch and would chew on it, and at some point, we swept the porch, can't imagine when we did it, but at some point, we swept the porch, and uh, some of that corn fell into the flower bed, and last year, a stalk of corn started growing in our flower bed. At first, I went to pull it as a weed, but then as I looked at it, I thought, I think that's corn, so I'll let it be and see what happens, and so we did. We let it alone, and it it grew about three feet and uh, actually produced one small, tiny, scraggly ear of corn, and so Jan took pictures and posted on Facebook and talked about how we were farmers, so that's 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 the farming that, that, that we have done. This morning we're looking at a parable Jesus told about the story of a farmer as his allegory. Now folks listening to him at that time would have known quite a bit about farming. It was an agrarian society. The only other major industry was fishing. The knowledge of farming would have been very commonplace. Jesus is teaching about the kingdom of God, and he tells this story to talk about who successfully grows in the kingdom and who falls away. It is a story about growth in the Christian life. Now, this morning, we're going to see that all life comes from soil. And that the quality of that soil matters. There are four soils. And we will spend a little time talking about preparing your soil. But first of all, all life comes from soil. One can go back to creation and see that human life began with soil. Genesis 2, 7 says, When God formed man of the dust of of the ground. So the original man comes from soil. Our chemical, biological makeup comes from the things of the earth. We all, in a sense, have come from soil. Our lives are formed somewhat by the soil in which we were planted. In psychology, They call it the family of origin. The parents we had, the siblings we grew up with, and perhaps grandparents and others formed the soil that allowed us to thrive or kept us weak and barely surviving. If you grew up, for instance, with lots of praise, you might have grown into a confident person. But if you grew up with lots of criticism, you might really struggle with self-confidence. We are made up a lot in our lives, a lot of our reactions, a lot of our thoughts come from the soil in which we were planted, the environment in which we grew up in. Much of what we believe, our values, our talents, had come from the soil of our families. The importance of families cannot be underestimated. When families fail, society fails. One of the most important missions we can ever have as a church is to support families, to promote activities that bring families together 
and to even when necessary be the substitute family for those who have no positive family life and influences. The word church family should not be used casually, but should be meant and felt deeply. When Jan and Kelly and I joined this church, we were looking for a church family. And here we have found that. And we thank you for that. Biologically, families are made of blood. But families that make a meaningful difference are made of love. So Jesus, as he begins this parable, is talking about the kingdom or the family of God. This family will either thrive or it will die. Jesus begins, a man went out to sow grain. The man represents God, and the seed is his message. Just as a planted seed starts to grow, the word of God starts to deepen and grow within a person. So into the soil, you and I, the seed is cast. But not all seed has the same result. It depends on on the soil. And that brings us to our second point today. As we look at the four soils and the quality of those soils. First of all, there's the path. Some seed fell on the path and the birds ate it. Now the birds represent Satan. The seed on the path represents people who hear the word, but it's immediately lost. There are people who do not choose a Christian life because they simply are focused too intently on other things. They do not allow their hearts to be open to the possibility of belief because sometimes <clears throat> they fear that belief would mean sacrifice, Belief would mean I would have to change my lifestyle. Belief would mean I would have to see and look at my sinful self. Belief would mean that I would have to humble myself. Belief would mean that I would have to perhaps change some of the thoughts and ideas and I would have to sacrifice some of my pride. So they hear the word, but it's immediately lost. Some, for instance, see their happiness or security coming in their wealth. A man came to Jesus one day. We're familiar with this if you've grown up in church, the rich young ruler. And he comes and he says, Master, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds to this gentleman. And he says, well, you must commit, keep the commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and all your soul, and your neighbor as yourself, and all the other commandments that follow. And the young man said, I have kept these commandments since my youth. And then Jesus, I don't think looking in his eyes, but looking deep within his soul, said, there's one thing you lack. Go and sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. Now, it's an interesting statement because nowhere does Jesus command that everyone go and sell everything they have and give it all away. But he does this one young man. I believe it's because what he was seeing in his soul was the one thing that he loved more than God. The one thing that was more important to him than God. In that man, it was his riches. He saw in him that he was depending on his wealth 
and was not depending on God. And so he rejected the word. The seed never grew. Some people simply focus on themselves. The story of the farmer who had a tremendous yield one year. He could have done wonderful things for others with all of the extra crop that he had. But instead, he said, I'm going to tear down my barns and I'm going to build bigger barns. And I'm going to sit back and I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. It's all about himself. And the response from God was, you fool, this very night, your soul will be required of you. You see, he was depending upon himself and what he had accomplished. He wasn't thinking about death and eternity. And so the seed never grew. And some people look to power as their source of safety. It, it, I'm sure you've seen it on the news at times when they've shown a parade in a communist country or a totalitarian country. And their parades are always about strength, if you watch them, what they show. It always shows the military marching down the street. And then it shows tanks coming down the street. And they don't have floats. They have trucks carrying, literally carrying missiles down the street. That's what they focus on, their power, their strength. Somehow they believe that if we have power, if we have strength, everything's going to be okay. You know, in the old days, Babylon was once very powerful. It fell. Greece was once the most powerful nation in the world. It has long faded. Rome was powerful, but we all know about the rise and fall of Rome. England's worldwide empire is a mere shadow of its glory days. Germany's Third Reich, that was to last a thousand years, did not last even two decades. And if you think our nation will be powerful forever, you are a poor student of history and most likely a fool. I love our country. And I try to participate in a dignified and Christ-like manner in our politics. But I do not depend on my country for my happiness, for my hope, or for my eternal destiny. Remember, Satan is represented by the birds. He will tempt you to fall prey in trusting something other than God, in trusting in wealth, in trusting in power, in trusting in nation, in trusting in yourself. But trust in God alone is your hope. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Now, some seed fell on rocky ground where there is little soil. The seed sprouted, but when the sun came up, it burnt the young plants. The seed on rocky ground represents people who respond with initial enthusiasm, but the word of God does not sink in deeply. When persecution or hard times, represented by the scorching sun, come along, they give up. Some people are initially attracted to the Christian lifestyle, but when the going gets tough, they give up. And sometimes, this is the fault of the church. Sometimes we overpromise. We lead people to the impression that becoming a Christian solves all your problems rather than gives you a source of help for the problems of life. The health and wealth preachers we find on TV today 
are preaching a heresy that attracts and deceives people. They twist Scripture out of context to promise that God wants you to have everything your heart desires. When in reality, what God desires is your heart. A heart of compassion and of love for others. He did not call us to a life of ease. Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me. Does that sound like it's going to be easy all the time? Pick up your cross and follow me. Young Christians get confused and lost because we often offer simplest, simplistic, simplistic, simplistic answers to the problems of life. You know, we have some great sounding slogans, but we leave out the meat too often. You may have a sign or a plaque that says prayer changes things. I've seen bumper stickers that say Jesus is the answer. And those things are absolutely true. But it is much more complex than that. Telling a frightened young lady whose boyfriend is beating her to pray about it is frankly not very helpful. Our prayers must have hands of help, feet of support, and wings of action that provide true help. Do not pray a prayer to God without in your heart. Have a willingness to be part of the answer that God wants to provide. Remember that when you pray, and it will change your prayer life. Coming to Christ is simple. Growing in Christ is not. Each of us must strive to have depth of in our faith and understanding of God. We should present the gospel in plain and understandable language. However, to stay on the milk and not have the spiritual discipline to understand the deeper things of God is to fail to become everything God wants us to be. Paul admonishes the Corinthians for failing to grow up. In 1 Corinthians 3, 2, we read, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not ready, for you are still of the flesh. Believe me, Paul did not mean that as a compliment. And then we see that some seeds fell among thorn bushes, which grew up and choked the plants. The word is heard. But people's concerns with the busyness of their lives and what others might think of them causes the plant to be choked off and die. And this is especially true among young people their worries and busy lives as they begin to go out into the world and their concerns for how they appear to their peers often choke out their attachment to Jesus and the things of God. Right now, speaking of the church universal, we are losing the battle for the souls of our children. The number of young adults identifying as non-believers is growing at a rapid rate, far outstripping the growth of new Christians. It is now estimated that Christians will be a minority group in America by 2070. Seems like a long time away. It's the same time as 1974 to today. Now, how many of us here remember 1974. Most of us in this audience do. And how long ago does that really seem to you? Those children, 
back there in our kids' church will more than likely be around to be in that minority. We have to seriously ask ourselves, what are we doing as a church to pull out the weeds and allow our children to grow in Christ? What are we doing as they transition from childhood into adulthood? What are we intentional about in helping that process teach them to cling to the knowledge of Jesus they grew up with? We have to examine ourselves and see where we fail at passing our faith along to our young people. Now, don't get me wrong. I'll be the very first one to acknowledge that I am somewhat at a loss for the answers. I don't know. To tell you that finding those answers needs to be a main focus of what we do as a church going forward or we will die and our kids will be lost. We've got to figure this out. And we have to be urgent about that. Every one of us, whether we are 19 or 90, needs to be earnestly praying and searching for what part we can play in reversing this trend. And then some seeds fell on good soil and produced a crop. Good soil represents people who hear the message and live it in their lives. Some people have strong faith and remain dedicated throughout their life to a Christian lifestyle, even when things are difficult. Some of us were blessed to grow up hearing the Word of God. Becoming a Christian was as natural to us as going to school. It was just something you did. I have been told that I was the very first baby in the nursery at Central Christian Church in St. Petersburg. I remember vaguely an incident in beginner church where they let me sing a solo. I remember standing on a bench and singing, Jesus Loves Me. And I believe my performance at four years old was the last time anyone ever requested to hear me sing. I remember how excited we were when the Lookout magazine, how do you remember the Lookout? When the Lookout magazine did a survey of junior churches across America, and our junior church that I was in at the time was the largest in the nation. I went to church camp every single chance I could. I was a jet cadet. I was active in youth groups as a teen and went to area youth rallies. If they unlocked the church building... Our family was there. And there was some good soil in much of that. I was blessed by wonderful, very ordinary people who taught me in Sunday school. The prayer I recite before I preach was taught to me by my seventh grade Sunday school teacher. We ended our seventh grade Sunday school class each week saying that prayer from Scripture. And I've never forgotten it. And it's become a part of my life. I doubt he, I doubt he's alive, but I doubt he ever knew that. He had that kind of influence. Many of you have provided good soil for others with your work in church and Sunday school and VBS over the years. You may not know till eternity who all you have blessed. I am thankful for those that try to cultivate a good place for the seed of Christ to grow in the hearts of others. Lastly this morning, we need to look at preparing your soil. And this is our final point this morning. We have a responsibility to prepare our soil so that we cannot remain as babes in Christ, but grow to the maturity 
that Christ expects of us. We prepare our soil in a, with an active prayer life. You can't know God well if you don't talk with Him often. Prayer fertilizes our soil with the richness that only walking with God can give. I think we too often think of public prayer when we think about a prayer life. Prayer at our evening meal and prayers at church are certainly germane to the Christian walk. But a prayer life consists of having a God mindset. You talk with Him in your heart and your mind as you go through each day. It shows in your gratitude and in your dependence on Him and in your concern for others. It is a little whispered prayers that open our hearts to hear the prompting of the Holy Spirit. We prepare our soil also by diving into the Word of God. We will not grow if we are unwilling to continually dive a little deeper. You know, sometimes in conservative Christianity, we almost celebrate ignorance as a badge of faith. My, my son is a theologian, and that sends shivers through a lot of evangelicals. I know he gets frustrated at times as Christians think of theology as not being the simple gospel therefore a waste of time to pursue. Theology is knowing God. That is the very definition of theology. And knowing God is the job of every Christian. It is not an act of humility, nor it is an act of piety to allow yourself to be ignorant of the deeper things of God. And the more we study, the deeper we go. And the better we know God. If we want to grow, then we need to make our soil good by being willing to delve deep within the Word of God. The Apostle Paul wrote most of the New Testament. And by the way, he was a highly educated man. We need, with whatever degree of ability we have, to open God's Word and to prayerfully study it to the best of our ability. And to have the discipline to learn a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And we will know God a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. So how's your soil today? Do you feel like you are still a growing Christian? Would Paul call you a mature Christian? What kind of soil are you for others? When people see you, do they see Christ in you? Do you wear the name of Christ or do you live like Christ? Out on the battlefield, Alexander the Great was set up in his tent. When brought before him was a very young soldier who had turned and ran in the face of battle. Punishment for that was death. Alexander looked at this trembling young man kneeling before him. And he said, son, what is your name? And the boy looked up at Alexander the Great Shaking and trembling, he said, my name, too, is Alexander. And Alexander leapt to his feet and pointed at that young man, and he said, young man, you either change your name or change your conduct. And I believe that God in heaven sometimes looks down at his church, and he says, people, change your name or change your conduct conduct and in the name of Jesus Christ may our conduct reflect who Jesus really is let's pray 
Father in heaven, give us the strength, the wisdom, and the courage to be everything you want us to be. To make our soil rich and deep in your word and to share that with others. Not just through our words, but through our lives, through our love, and through our actions. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be standing. By trusting in his word. Only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. He will save you, he will save you, he will save you now. Yes, Jesus is the truth, the way that leads you. him only trust him now he will save you he will save you he will save you now thank you dom great message again thank you martha and irene and candy good job <clears throat> hope you all leave here today and uh Ready to be good witnesses for God and enjoying this weather as much as I do. I hope you do. Uh, this early taste of fall. So have a good week and let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks for the opportunity we've had to come into your house and, and worship you this morning. We thank you for the message that we've heard. Let each one of us take it in our hearts and help each one of us be a better witness for you as we go about our week, our, our work, our, our uh, contact with our friends and neighbors. Just help us be a good witness. Dear Heavenly Father, special prayers this week for the Witt family. Uh, just uh, be with each family member. Uh, just help uh, comfort them. Uh, we just thank you for the life of Richard and uh, everything he meant to this church. We just thank you for the example that he was. And we just uh, thank you for blessing him with a long life. Dear Heavenly Father, we just ask that you forgive us where we fail thee. In his name we pray, amen. God be with you till we meet again. Counsel guide uphold you with his sheep secure.